All right. Thanks so much, Mika and, uh, and Marta. We're really excited to hear about this new project and uh, excited to see where it goes. So it's great to be back at PDF. And uh, I'm, I'm reminded that the last time I was here uh, doing a session was a couple of years back. And we were just at the start of this, this inquiry about, well, you know, what about that old thing, antitrust? And what about that old thing about monopoly power? And does that have something to say to uh, the digital age? And I think uh, the headlines, even just today, uh, shows how far the conversation has come. Uh, and I was really appreciating, Marta, when you were kind of running through the slides, you know, uh, con law professor by background, you'd be surprised how many constitutional law cases are about that moment of filled milk, right? And it's actually about this moment where you have a thing that basically everybody uses all the time that is produced by a set of actors who we kind of think they're operating in the public interest, but we really don't know. Uh, and what are the kinds of laws, institutions, and independent civil society power and organization we need to build to kind of keep them honest, right? And I feel like that's actually really where we are with tech. So what I want to talk a little bit about now is uh, sort of a way of conceptualizing this, this moment with big tech and then point to some of the, the solutions or directions for solutions that uh, Mika talked about and that uh, Harold will pick up on uh, in a moment. And the big analogy that I want to leave us all with, I'll say at the outset, is that when we talk about tech, it's not about individual products or services. Really what this is, is it is the infrastructure for our society that is designed and run by private for-profit actors. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a thing that we need to think about, right? And how do we make sure that that infrastructure actually serves the democracy and serves our public good? So if we flash back for a moment, uh, 100 plus years ago to, to that time before the New Deal when uh, you kind of first see the, uh, the changes of industrialization and new forms of, of private power. This is exactly the debate that uh, folks in the progressive era were having. And the key analogy for them at the time was, well, look, if we live in a democracy, we expect checks and balances of our public actors, right? The government has all this coercive power and the whole reason why we have elections, the whole reason why we have the separation of powers in the Constitution is to ensure that that power is deployed towards the public good. But now we have all these private actors who are basically mini governments of their own, right? Uh, they are running the railroads. They uh, resource our oil and gas. Uh, they run our electric companies and our uh, municipal transportation before it was shifted to public authorities. And the question was, how do we make sure that there are checks and balances on those organizations? And what you got was a set of not just the rise of, uh, in addition to the rise of, of consumer reports and the consumer rights movement, right, and the labor movement all happening at the same time uh, to provide checks and balances from civil society, you also had the creation of the new regulatory infrastructure, antitrust laws, public utility commissions, things that would become the FDA, the FCC, the FTC. The whole alphabet soup of New Deal uh, administration uh, agencies came out of that moment. And I think we're in a similar kind of moment today. So let's talk a little bit for then a second about what we're actually faced up against when, we're up, when we talk about big tech. So it's easy to think about it in terms of the firms and in terms of the services, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Amazon. Uh, but really, I think what we want to zero in on is, the, is what are the kinds of power that these companies have? And how do we have design checks and balances for those particular types of power? So I, wanted, I think there are three uh, types in particular to name. The first is what I think of as transmission power. And so this is like, think railroads in the 19th century. And the analogy would be to something like Amazon or even Google or Facebook today. They're, they're, uh, big tech literally controls, owns, has built the tracks through which information, data, goods, and services flow. And that's a good thing, right? It creates all sorts of uh, new possibilities. But it also means that those tracks are controlled by someone else. And if they want to direct those tracks in a certain way, they can do that. And so when we worry about, for example, what information you're able to access through search, if you're a small business, are your results are actually going to come up uh, when someone Googles for something? Or when uh, Amazon, as our retail infrastructure, can actually direct people to particular services, particular companies over others, and just creates opportunity for self-dealing, self-interest, rent-seeking. Then there's a second kind of power, which I think of as gatekeeping power. It's similar to transmission power, but here the idea is uh, who controls the gateway, the point of access to the marketplace itself. If you're not on Amazon and you're a retailer, you're screwed, right? 
And if you're not able to get your information out on Google or Facebook and you're a media producer, a content producer, good luck. And so that creates another choke point. And for each of these, you know, it's possible for, just because the uh, company has this power doesn't necessarily mean it'll be abused, right? It's not just about outcomes. But the point is that, that having that power absent checks and balances puts us, the public, the democracy, in a position of vulnerability, right? We are dependent on their goodwill to make it all work. And that's just sooner or later, that's gonna be untenable. <coughs> the last kind of power that I think we're dealing with here is what a number of scholars and uh, folks have uh, termed scoring power. And this goes to some of the, uh, the racial profiling examples that Marta raised. A lot of what we're doing online, our data is being mined and tracked, and, it, in, and then it is being scored and ranked in, some, in one way or another. So whether you can get a mortgage or a loan, or whether you can even get a job that you applied for without knowing it, you have been given a score by a lot of these uh, data mining systems about, whether, about your employer employment worthiness, which lo and behold is completely racialized and gendered and uh, has all sorts of problems. So these are three types of power, transmission, <coughs> gatekeeping, and scoring. So how do we deal with that? I think the fork in the road that we're facing now when it comes to public policy is uh, how much we're going to lean on industry self-regulation versus government oversight, the second option, versus a third set of options, which I would call as more structural reforms. And I actually think you need all three of them, but I want to focus on the third bucket, the structural reform bucket. Because uh, the problem with the, or not the problem, but the, the challenge with the first two is at a certain point, if the incentives are strong enough, industry is always going to stay ahead, right? So when Marta's talking about the need to innovate and explore ahead of, and keep pace, ahead, be a pace setter, for consumer reports ahead of where government is and ahead of where industry is. That's part of the arms race, right? Um, we need to resource that ability because so long as it's just cheaper and more profitable to mine data and uh, uh, extract rents by controlling transmission and scoring and gatekeeping, it's going to happen. And so because of that, I think there's this third set of <coughs> policy ideas which are which I call, think of as structural reforms that we need to get at. And by structural reforms, I mean those reforms that fundamentally alter the powers and capacities and incentives that these companies face. So we'll pause for a moment for those folks who are, uh, uh, remember the financial crisis now a decade ago. We had this big debate about too big to fail banks. And in a lot of ways, I feel like where the finance debate was in 2008 and 9 is where the tech debate is now, right? We just had a series of cataclysms that woke us up to the sense that this thing that we all lean on and rely on is actually really dangerous and problematic. And we're just at the start of thinking through what the new policy solutions would be. And if you think back to that moment around too big to fail finance, the big debate was actually about, well, are we going to trust the JP Morgans of the world to govern themselves? Are we going to trust the Fed to keep an eye on them? That's a lot of what Dodd-Frank bill did in 2010, or are we going to actually try to do something to change the business model, reimpose uh, Glass-Steagall, put a financial transaction tax, uh, do something to actually break up the banks. And the point of all of those proposals was to change the incentives so that you actually make banking boring again, make it less profitable and desirable for financial firms to engage in the kind of high stakes, high risk, high externality uh, financial innovation that led to the crisis. And when I think of structural reforms for tech, I think it's a similar type of analogy. What are the types of uh, bright line rules that we want to bring back into the fold uh, to change the incentives, change the business model? So let me mention a couple of concrete ideas here. One is antitrust law. So we've got the hearings already happening in the House, uh, and the FTC has taken a renewed interest here. Um, and the basic idea here is to cut these firms down to size, right? It's, it's totally great to innovate new products and to to succeed as a result of that. But if, you're, if your business model is that you're going to be the marketplace, you can't also be the seller, right? Because that is just a basic conflict of interest. So if Amazon's going to run a retail marketplace, it can't also double deal with its own products on the, on the platform. If your business model is that you're going to be the gatekeeper to content, Google search or Facebook, fair enough. But then there are going to be limits on how you can exercise that power. Otherwise, it's not going to be fair and equal. So there's a whole set of uh, antitrust laws that, would, that have to do with uh, preventing mergers and acquisitions, preventing these firms from getting, uh, becoming too big in the first place, reimposing limits like the separation of 
uh, managing the platform on the one hand and producing uh, products on the other. Then there's a set of policies which I think of as public utility policies. And here, think of something like the net neutrality debate from a couple years ago. If you are run the piping for the system, how do we make sure that you do so in a way that is non-discriminatory and non-exploitative and treats all comers fairly? That's what the net neutrality debate was about when it came to ISPs. That's a version of what we're starting to debate now when it comes to online platforms. How do we make sure that when it comes to information, the Googles and Facebooks of the world are actually uh, dealing fairly, or when it comes to uh, retail, that Amazon is treating everyone fairly. Uh, then I think there's a, a, a last set of structural debates, which has to do with checks and balances. So if you have a competitive market, lots of, you know, your classic competitive market, uh, the market itself is a form of checks and balance, right? You have competitors, and there's only so much you can get away with before you lose market share to somebody else. But when you're a private firm that basically runs the infrastructure for a modern society, <coughs> where is everybody going to go? <coughs> Excuse me. Competition does not provide the checks and balances in that scenario. So what are the other forms no, good things. What are the other forms of uh, democratic control, democratic checks and balances that we can create for these systems? And that's something that I think we don't, we don't yet have a good policy answer to. I think there's some really great ideas around, for example, what would um, what do we need to create a sort of new regulatory model? You know, if the FCC was created to manage the rise of broadcast media, is there a regulatory agency that we need to create that would provide sort of the public's interest when it comes to uh, data and tech and privacy and all the and algorithmic bias and all the rest? Um, are there checks and balances even within these firms? Right, we've. Many of you may be following some of what's going on with the organizing around tech workers within these firms and uh, how do we bring in other stakeholders who are affected by what these firms do into those internal decision-making processes, right? So you have a kind of internal democracy within a lot of these firms. So I think there are a lot of uh, rich ideas to, to think about here. But what I'll leave you all with in closing is just to sum up uh, uh, two points. First is that when we're talking about big tech, we're talking about the modern infrastructure of our whole economy and our whole society. That creates unique challenges. And then the second point, because of those unique challenges, our reform toolkit, our policy toolkit, has to include more than just more ethics and good self-governance on the part of the firm. We have to create the kind of checks and balances that are up to the task of managing this new form of infrastructure. So let me toss it back to Mika. <laughs>